and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. Now, for 25 years, the L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO have been working together to empower and promote women in science through the Four Women in Science program. Now, Malaysia has been part of the program for the last 18 years, and during that time, over one and a half million ringgit in research grants have been awarded to more than 51 women scientists in recognition of their achievement in science. So this year, three outstanding Malaysian beneficiaries have been selected, and I'm delighted to introduce them on the show. Let's begin with Dr. Edgar Cheng, who is uh, from the Institute of Biological Sciences at University of Malaya. And then we have Dr. Chiazura Hanim Che uh, Abdullah, more fondly known as Dr. Chacha, Chacha which is your, the acronym of your name. And uh, you are from the Faculty of Science in yes. UPM. Yes. And Dr. Alina Azizan from the Faculty of Medicine at UKM. Thank yes. you everyone for being on the show with me today. I appreciate your time and congratulations on uh, getting recognized for your work. I'm sure it's been a long time coming, but I'm very proud of you and happy to have you here to tell us a little bit more about, about your work. So let, let's talk a little bit about, um, about your, your field of study, your research and what led to getting recognized in your field. Um, if I, I'll begin on the far end with Dr. Elena, if I may. Um, tell me a little bit about your research. Now, I'm going to read off um, just based on this. I'm not a science, uh, I don't have a science background, but I'm curious to learn more about adrenal sulfate. So tell me more about your research. Yeah, so um, the research that is um, sponsored or going to receive the grant awarded by L'Oreal UNESCO is actually in regards to inhibition of an enzyme that produces a hormone called aldosterone, um, which is produced in your adrenal. So okay. most people don't know what the adrenal is. It's normally situated on a kidney, mm. maybe more familiar for others. And that hormone causes you to have a higher blood pressure. So we're looking at what happens when you inhibit that enzyme. Yeah, and the reason why we got interested in this is because uh, when we had looked at um, genetically inhibiting it, so silencing it um, uh, so that it doesn't get expressed, mm -hmm. then we found that it affects adrenal sulfate. So adrenal sulfate, what is that, right? It sounds just yeah. nothing, right? <laughs> so, I mean, adrenal sulfate is when, uh, for example, I am a cell, mm -hmm. a cell in the adrenal, and I tell myself to die, <laughs> something like that. So, it's, it's my fate to die. Right, okay? so that's the, yeah. the, the, the fate part. Yeah, it's the fate. Research. So, I'm or I'm going to tell myself to move. That's another fate, to migrate. Right. So, to die or to, to migrate. migrate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like so, so if I can just follow up while, while I, I have you. So the, um, what implications do you see for adrenal-related diseases, your, your research? You're absolutely right. I don't think a lot of us are aware. But for those who suffer from Cushing's disease or from um, uh, other adrenal-related diseases, that this would have you know, real-life implications, right? Yeah. So... My disease is more to aldosterone, so Cushing would be another hormone. Another, okay. Yeah, another hormone called cortisol, which is in the other layer of the cortex. So I'm in the outer layer of the adrenal cortex, which is aldosterone, and it would affect people with primary aldosteronism. So okay. primary aldosterone, we have um, a lot of aldosterone. And actually, just recently, 2023, just off the press, there were some um, CYP11B2 inhibitors being tested out to treat hypertension. Does it affect yeah. a lot of people? Yeah, so it will affect one in 10 hypertensive cases. Wow. Yeah, so, and especially if you're resistant hypertensive, then that would go to one in, uh, you know, 20% of the cases okay. would happen. D did yeah. you always know this was something you wanted to study as a, a re field of research? Was it was it a, a happy accident that you? It, it was serendipity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was just um, I had two offers from Cambridge. Do I want to work on obesity or do I want to work on primary aldosteronism? Okay. So it was one or the other. Yeah. Okay. We'll come yeah. back to your journey in science, and we'll, let's come to Dr. Chacha and let tell me more about pod rot, called the black 
pod fungus. So tell yes. me more about your research. Okay, so basically I'm a nanotechnology, so I'm creating a small, small thing. Not because I'm, my size is small, <laughs> but uh, this nanotechnology is, um, I think it's quite uh, interesting because it can help a lot in terms of the disease management. Previously, I'm focusing on the nanomaterials for uh, breast cancer, oh. but now I transition from personalized medicine to personalized agriculture, I can say. So basically, we would like to, because you, you have the disease as well, and now we are focusing from uh, human disease to plant disease, like cocoa disease. So this black pot disease basically uh, caused by a harmful fungus. So the you know, like we enjoy chocolate, but no one's like appreciate what is how behind it, yeah, the, how, the chocolate. How it gets yes. to that chocolate bar. Yes. <laughs> so in order to get a good chocolate, we need to make sure our cocoa pot is healthy. So in terms of the disease that affect cocoa, black pot disease is the one that um, we really need to fight right. in order to make sure we have like sustainability. Uh, we have like, uh, we know not only for the uh, cocoa farmers, mm. but also for the uh, future sustainability of chocolate. Okay, so it will impact agricultural yes, practices. Yes, yes. So that's how, I love to hear how you transition from one field to the next. You, this, this, those skills are transferable and I think that's quite wonderful. All right, we'll come back to nanotechnology in just a little bit. Um, Dr. Ega, tell me yeah. about what implications your research might have. Okay, so climate change is happening, whether we like it or not. So basically, uh, in my proposed study, I propose to actually shift from our lowland farming, rice farming, which is flooded mm. farming, into something that we call aerobic rice cultivation. Aerobic rice cultivation, you do not need flooded conditions. It's just like growing other plants like vegetable. Mm. So why did I actually suggest that? Because that will actually help to reduce water usage in rice farming, you see? Because rice then does not need to be submerged in water. But the problem is we have been um, introducing this particular technology back in uh, about a decade ago, back in 2013, mm -hmm. but somehow it has not been really well received by our farmers and this for several reasons and one of which is that because the yield of aerobic rice actually lower than those of lowland rice, the mm -hmm. rice that we have now. So in order to improve the yield, that, that's where my project comes in. I bring in something that we call soil microbes. Okay, there, there's something that uh, I would say the novel part of this study. Soil microbes, why soil microbes? Because uh, microbes are actually the organisms that help to transform soil materials into nutrients for most plants. For example, our aerobic rice. Okay. So that interaction would actually help Increase to the yield. increase the yield oh, okay. while replenish the soil because soil microbes you see they live in the soil and they actually have the symbiotic relationship with plants. Your research must come at the most um, opportune time because of all the the problems we've had with rice shortages yes. and rethinking about our our food security. Exactly. What yeah. made you want to pursue, if I may quote to your research, the crosstalk between aerobic rice and soil microbes? Yeah, I mean, uh, the crosstalk, uh, actually in layman term, would be the interaction. Interaction. Why we need to know the interaction more? Because even the interaction between humans, we want to know how we can effectively communicate with each other in mm. order to have really good communication, right? right. Same goes to different organisms. All right, and because Again, come back to climate change, drought conditions would be a problem, you know, different drought conditions, we don't have enough water, for mm. example, so yeah, we want to see if the, what happened to the interaction. If let's say we have lesser water, if let's say we have uh, a warmer temperature, yeah, so yeah. what would There's happen to that? There's a drought yes. or changes in the extreme weather patterns that yes. we've been already seeing. Mm. What made you want to study the, the um, um, in this field, but specifically with aerobic rice? Um, 
Sorry, come what, what made you want to study or to go into this field specifically? Okay, because I I am currently working with uh, United States on uh, aerobic rice actually. So yeah, I, I saw that this particular technology is pretty interesting, mm. and we we don't have a really efficient aerobic rice cultivation right here in Malaysia, and I I feel like it's time for us to do something about it. So in, through the course of your journey and your work, I'm curious to know um, whether you feel that there have been specific challenges that you would, you know, in looking back, that you've had to kind of overcome to get to, to the point that you are, and whether those challenges may have a gendered dimension to them. Are there challenges that you face because you're a woman, because you're a woman in science, and there are so few, um, incre increasing, but still so few. So. What would you say are some of the challenges that you've encountered through the course of your scientific career and also in trying to get this research to be, um, to, to find the grant money for this research, Dr. Well, uh, sometimes, you know, one thing when you're trying to present your research, for example, sometimes you think, okay, am I wearing the right thing? Because I don't want to get off as too sexy or I don't want to get off as too serious or right. I don't want to, and like I don't think men need to think about that right you know so th that I feel is sort of like a female because you want to be taken seriously Understood. and you you don't want to be taken oh she got there maybe because of so and so or mm. what and what you know so I think that is some sort of challenges I think if to put it like in the sports world, like Serena was saying, how come they're asking me about my clothes? Yeah. You know, stuff like that. So it's, uh, I think those are the challenges from the woman's side. And just to, when you're in a room, and in my field at least, um, when you get more senior and more senior, in especially um, where I came was in UK, where I had my research um, degree, it was quite a boys club as the more higher you go. Right. Yeah, so then sometimes you are not looked as, as an equivalent or as a... So you have to like say, this is my work. Listen to me. Did, yeah. did, you, did you, do you also feel that, that there is um, maybe a perception of what a woman scientist should look like, should behave, should act like, and if you don't fit into that mold, you're not taken as seriously or as, you know, not given the, the respect due. Is that, has that been the case for either one of you, Dr. Yeah. Jasha? For me, uh, I think we need more women scientists to be a role model and more um, appearance in the media. Mm. And then, for example, we, we have a lot of outreach to, to gain more uh, people in uh, STEM. Mm. But I think for women, I think we need to do something yeah, it's like Elena did mention. So I think we need people to also like respect us like women. Yeah. And in terms of other challenges, I can say um, maybe I think as a woman, we need to juggle between your career as a scientist mm -hmm. and then of course your family. And one more, I think funding. That's why I think all three of us really thank Laurier for this oh. opportunity. Because I think um, now, in order to proceed further, we need more funding, we need support. Yes, for sure. Dr. Agar, do you have anything to add to that in terms of challenges? Did you face anything or find um, you have to overcome more hurdles, run twice as fast to get where you want to go than perhaps a male appear in, in your role? Okay, I must say that I'm lucky because up to this point, I have not really faced issues like that, like gender-based issues. Okay. But I, I would like to say that the, the current generation, like my students, because as a researcher, I'm also an academic who mm. actually uh, have students okay. supervising so you, some you students. So you teach, you lecture? Yeah, I lecture and then I have several female students that actually um, in between their study, they got married, mm -hmm. have children. I can see some changes, not so positive one, uh, during the transition between a single girl to a married woman, you know, yeah. and then they need to plan when they are pregnant because I'm a scientist. They are also going to be a scientist and they need to work in the lab. But because of 
pregnancy, they, they actually couldn't work in the lab, those who are pregnant. Right. So yeah, that actually delay their study. And once you have the baby out, you know, your focus actually not yeah, you, there. Your, your attention is, is split, right? Yeah, I, I would say that would be some of the challenges faced by female scientists, not me, but generally to many of the uh, female researchers throughout the world. So yeah. last week, my guest on the show was from Women in Tech, which also aims to increase participation of women in, in STEAM fields. And she shared a, a remarkable statistic to say that from the point of women, girls and women who are studying in, in STEM fields, 40% drop out before they uh, reach to the um, higher ranking roles. So you have women in scientific fields, but then they, um, they drop out before they can reach, uh, they can break that kind of glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. So how, how has it been for you throughout your career? Have you seen an improvement in representation of women? Like when you look around your, your lab, where you're, wherever you're working, do you see more people like you from maybe the same kind or, or diversity at least in your in your areas, um, Dr. Chacha, do you see diversity? Yes, in you? yes. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you're seeing more. You're seeing yes. a positive um, increase. Yes. Okay. But I think um, we need more women, and the most important, I think, we need people to support. Right. So when we talk about gender, so I think I'm lucky because I think my family, my husband, is really, um, you know, like respect when I say that. Okay, I need to to be in the lab for such a long time because as a woman scientist sometimes we are in the lab mm. so we need people to really support Understood. the word is like support yeah. so I think the support and the ecosystem is important for us mm. I, I think we are all here because yes. we have amazing support yes but who, what about those who don't have that support right. but who are still passionate about science so if they happen. don't get the support personally or from their spouse or from the society or mm. the, the government, they need to support these people mm. if they don't have it. Can yeah. I ask you about visibility? One of the things that I'm very cognizant of being um, a media practitioner is how, how the disparity between asking a male expert in the field or looking for a female expert. You know, 2023 and there are still manuals happening. I don't know whether that's been the case where you get invited in, to a conference and you see a you know, an all-male panel that's um, speaking about a topic. But um, are you seeing changes or positive improvements in um, speaking invitations, in media appearances, in um, also funding and research and awards like the one that uh, UNESCO and L'Oreal is giving? Does that help? Are you seeing more of that? And how does that help a woman scientist further along in her career? Dr. Lina? I think um, definitely if you look in my field medicine, there's so many females, okay? <laughs> a lot of females go in there. A lot, there's a lot. In, in my lab, for example, all of my postgraduates are females. Oh. Yeah, all of them are That's females. That's encouraging. Yeah, 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 it's very... But what is the problem is that it's a leaking pipe. Mm. So you have so many females coming in but how come they don't stay in? So what is it? I, I'm trying to understand what is it that makes them, and I, I don't understand, but I think it is, I'm, we are lucky that we have the support and probably they don't have. So for example, one of my um, postgraduate students, um, she got pregnant twice during the PhD, similar <laughs> to Dr. Edgar's um, student. And what happens is that her focus does come down. And if there was support, like say, for example, the grant takes into account if the female the age, is... The, uh, age, the age limit. The yeah. age yeah. limit. Tell yeah. me more. So, so the age limit is um, a hindrance for women yes, to apply? Because currently there is, in yeah. terms of yeah. like uh, applying for a research grant, I think we especially like young research yes yeah. young research so yeah. the age limit is 40. so what happened if the girls or the women start a bit late right mm. okay so then you miss out on all the potential applicants who could and w want to apply but mm. haven't made the cut in terms of age mm. dr Agar, do you have anything to add in terms of you know whether you think um, things are improving when it comes to visibility of, of women and representation of women 
I guess I saw an improvement in that particular sense in a way that because let's say I study genetics back then they actually gave the Nobel Prize to two male like Watson and Crick for <laughs> DNA discovery but they missed out a really important woman that discovered for her to die. Yeah. <laughs> but now you see our gene editing tools two women actually got the Nobel Prize for it so they really recognize women now so it's a good thing to see when you speak to people, do they, and you tell them what you do, right? When you, somebody says, what do you do? And you have to explain your fields of research. Are they often surprised? Do they understand? Do they accept you? I, I, I guess I'm wondering, I speak to people anecdotally and ask, can you name a female scientist? And very few people can be on Marie Curie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, what can we do to change that conversation so that it becomes almost second nature to think of um, a scientist and regardless of what gender it is, but a woman scientist also comes to mind, not just uh, you know, like a crazy Einstein hair <laughs> and that lab coat. Um, what would you like to, do to see change in the narrative of how women in science are presented or portrayed? more recognition would be the best way forward i guess mm -hmm. like nobel prize and l'oreal for example this is really a really good uh efforts to help yeah. us actually yeah. yeah you see now three of us are here because of uh this award, this award. yeah mm -hmm. okay so what happens next after after this um award so after you get the research grant what, what is what is the future like what's 2024 like when it comes to your work in this research? So the research per se or for women? For, uh, for, for, for you personally. <laughs> so for me personally, well, I, I, I really am passionate about adrenals. So okay. I hope I will continue studying about adrenals. I actually have a, a separate grant where I'm looking at single cell work of the adrenals, where I study every single, sing, every single cell in the adrenal. So I hope that we'll all um, manufacture to a deeper understanding and hopefully uh, primary aldosterone is of course hypertension and hypertension a lot of people are unaware so I hope everyone out there go check your blood pressure check your blood, <laughs> blood pressure, pressure. <laughs> yeah could be caused by can, primary can aldosterone can I ask you yeah. what would what is the dream what would you hope your work achieves um, and how do you see it maybe one day changing medical treatment well I, I hope a lot of people are aware of the, this, this disease, mm. that it could be caused from something else, not just dietary or lifestyle, right. it could be a hormonal cause, and that it gets treated and cured and, you know, totally cured, not, not eating medicine cure. You know, when yeah, you have hypertension, yeah. you eat medicine for life. Mm. I'm talking about cured, that's it, you're cured. You're looking to cure yeah. a disease. Yeah. Uh, aim high, I love it. Okay, Dr. Chacha, what about you? Okay. What, what, what happens next uh, for you in of your course, research? Of course, I will continue synthesize other material, but now my focus is more on the secular. So basically, I'm working with Malaysian Cocoa Board. So we recycle, we know we have issues with uh, black pot disease mm. that attack the cocoa trees. So we use the cocoa waste turned into this tiny particle, and this tiny particle we use to fight the black pot disease. So it's like, you know, like if you have like CCTV for your home to prevent from intruders. So we use this agriculture waste turn into tiny particles and these tiny particles like, you know, like Iron Man suit or superhero yeah. suit <laughs> that yes. you can give it to uh, cocoa trees right. so that can prevent them from the harmful fungus which that affect the black pot so, disease. So the dream is for the cocoa production to never have a Face, or the cocoa product never face black pod fungus at all in the yes, future. Yes, and then we can, of course, improve the farmer's income, more the job yield, opportunities, yeah. and of course, international trade. Wonderful. Huge implications for your <laughs> research. Dr. Aga, what about you? Mm, for me, I guess, um, I would want us to have uh, improved rice and of course in my case is aerobic rice high yielding more resilience because we still have not achieved our rice cell sufficiency you see, right. in malaysia so my dream of course for us to achieve that through uh, my work here and of course my other work as well 
Um, and this also will help to reduce the water usage as well as to benefiting our farmers all while fighting climate change. So this is something sustainable agriculture is something that I would like. It's a remarkable real life impact that you're actually working on every day. In the last few minutes that we have left, can I ask you maybe you can you know to, to the young women who are um, okay. watching tonight, girls, young women, parents uh, thinking about how they can encourage the children to foster an interest in STEM uh, fields. What would you say to someone considering considering your area, perhaps mm. even? Okay, um, I guess you need to be passionate on what you are doing. Passion it must be there. Right. Because once you have the passion, you will go for it. That's your dream to achieve it. And without my dream, I won't be here today. Mm. And without passion, I won't be here today. Mm. So if you really like something, if you find that DNA is mesmerizing, if you find that genetics is something that you really like, uh -huh. be passionate about it and just join some experiments and all that to see whether you really are into it or not and just go for it. Yeah, that, that would be what I would like to say. Maybe we can... Resilient. Mm. Apart from passion, we need resilience. Mm. I think for STEM, we really need resilience. We have many challenges, but you need to be able to adapt mm. and then be resilient so that you can stay. And one more, believe in yourself and don't, uh, you know, like some people, it's like, okay, if I join this uh, STEM, what happened if, uh, like, they're always afraid of failure. So don't oh. afraid of failure. And I see like each of the failure basically is opportunity. You need to change your mind, your mindset. Okay, this is failure. It's not the end of the world. Mm. This is maybe I can get something. That's why I also transitioned. Before this, I applied for L'Oreal for six times. So before this, um, you know, like I focusing on nanotechnology for breast cancer. So then I changed. Okay, another type of disease. So this year, I I don't know. I just like with the issues in Malaysia. So why don't I focus on the food? Uh, so it's like focusing Production, on food. Yeah. So then because I also have already started the collaboration with Malaysian uh, Cocoa Board. So I asked them during the Innovation Day. So what is your main uh, issues? Oh, so you asked them what, yes, I where the with gaps them. are? Yeah. Oh. So during the Innovation Day in Sabah, so they asked me to come and then I just like, okay, maybe I can share my research. So I asked them, what is your main issues? that I can maybe probably can help them. So that's why the, how can I change um, the... Yeah, so your yeah, contribution so to something that's meaningful and can be yes. changed. So that's why you got the, the you <laughs> became a beneficiary this year. That's why, that's why people say that how can you change from, uh, you know, like breast, breast cancer, cancer to mm -hmm. uh, cocoa pot. For me, it's like disease is disease, but just different Organism. organisms. <laughs> Wonderfully said. Dr. Alina, final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think um, do try to find a supportive network to have your STEM. I think at the moment, at the current moment, you do need a big support. I would say personally, I have such amazing support and that's why I can flourish. And I think do not let anyone that is like unsupportive of you be around you. Mm. You know, keep close those that are supportive of you. Yeah. Doctors, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. It's been such a pleasure. Congratulations once again. It's well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have for you on this episode of The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.